Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us to another of our Lepada leaders, um, which we started earlier in lockdown one, and here we find ourselves in lockdown three. Um, and I am delighted that we're going to talk to um, two uh, very well-known uh, faces to, to many of you today about restoration. Um, so what, what I also want to let you know, for those of you who haven't joined one of these before, at the bottom you'll see that there is a Q&A box and there's also a chat box. In the chat field we will be posting links to um, both projects and books and various things that William and Philip have shared with us as resources. So do have a look at that. There's also um, a Q&A box uh, where please do post any questions. We will address as many of those as we can at the end. Um, but also if there's something particularly relevant in the conversation, we might ad lib a bit and bring it in earlier, but there will be a time for some Q&As at the end. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you uh, to our speakers today, um, who are both homeowners uh, and they have uh, wrestled with the challenges of restoring uh, the houses that they now call their homes. So we will hear quite a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so Philip Mould, who is also a Lepada member, I'm delighted to say, is an international art dealer um, and has been based in London's Mayfair for the last 35 years. Um, he specialises in 500 years of British art and also spotting those rare and sometimes overlooked uh, masters uh, that uh, we know as sleepers um, and uh, has made uh, some great discoveries along the way. Uh, and you can read about some of these uh, in his books, Old Ma In Search of Lost Old Masters and Sleuth, um, which is a, an amazing quest for lost art treasures. And both of them read a little bit like art thrillers. Uh, they really are thoroughly good reads. Um, Philip is also known to many of you for his BBC One programme, They Call Fortune, and well, even better, I think, recently, uh, he's kept us entertained and, our sate and has sated our hunger for art uh, by writing and presenting 30 short programmes, Art in Isolation, and we will post the link to those with his son. Um, and they have been, uh, thank you so much for doing that for us, because we've all been uh, thirsting or, uh, to see a little bit more uh, art in lockdown, and you have helped quench that thirst. Um, and then on to William Cash, who is an award-winning editor and also author and self-confessed addict of Restore a Wreck. Um, and we will be hearing more about Upton Crescent Hall in Shropshire and his uh, labour of love um, there. But I first came across William Cash as editor of Spears magazine. Uh, he has uh, is an award-winning editor for that. Um, he also now has the uh, Politico magazine, The Mace, and also the Westminster Index. So if we want a who's who and a romp through the politics of today, uh, then have a look. And we can also post links to that in the chat. So before we get on to uh, the, the sort of questions and, and learn a bit more, Philip, would you like to give us a little um, sort of introduction to why you're with us today? Well, hello, uh, everybody. Um, so my name is Philip and I'm an old house owner and <laughs> I've had one for 20 years now. And it has been a, a sort of thrilling and now indivisible part of my life. I discovered it um, as a result of a, a property searcher um, around about, actually it was 21 years ago now, and have grown up with it. And it has become um, really, particularly in lockdown, uh, a beloved friend and all sorts of aspects of, of this place, which was built in 1627, um, uh, are now, I feel, part of me. Um, so I'm looking forward to discussing some of the aspects of it. Thank you, Philip. And William, tell us a little bit about your journey. Um, thank you. Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm William, and uh, I have been, or my family have been living at Upton Cresset for 50 years now. Uh, my father uh, was a lawyer in London uh, and decided in 1970 to become a member of SPAB, which is the Society of Protective Ancient Buildings. And in the SPAB a register of historic buildings at risk, he saw a very unlikely looking um, uh, ad, which basically said, uh, 
extremely wrecked manor house needs great amount of love and attention um, going cheap. That was the gist of it. Um, and on a, I think it was a sort of Sunday afternoon, we piled into a Citroen Safari. We lived in, in North London and we drove up, took about four hours and we came across this, I still remember it, I was about four or five at the time. And the house was, uh, we expected just to drive by and have a, a looky loo look. Um, but actually the doors had been removed by vandals. Um, and the whole place was something like out of a Daphne de Maurier novel, completely uninhabited, ruined. In fact, the only inhabitants were chickens and pigs. So the farmer had actually moved out because it was so in, in, inhospitable. And my parents fell in love with it. Um, and they embarked on a labor of love themselves for about two years, we were sort of camping out. And then after uh, cut to sort of 25 years later, after I'd had two um, rather painful divorces and lived in America, uh, I decided to retreat from the world, put the drawbridge up and devote two or three years of my life to sort of recreating a sort of Arcadia. Um, and it, my book tells the story of how I restored the house as a way to restore myself. So it's very much an emotional journey as well as a, a journey in learning about uh, how to uh, blend the perfect um, lime mortar uh, and, other, and other techniques. Thank you. And it's actually, it's a great read. I'm afraid I haven't got all the way through it yet because um, it came much later than, uh, than it said on the Amazon delivery. So I'm only halfway through, but it really is a, um, a labor of love in many, or affairs of the heart in many ways. Um, so Philip, on to you. Um, how, how, so it's a slightly different journey for you and slightly more recent, but why did you decide to buy this house? Um, mm. And when did your sort of project for restoration begin? Okay, so although originally uh, in life I'm from Liverpool, uh, as you can tell by my accent, um, <laughs> I, I, I moved to London and um, began to feel very itchy about 25 years ago um, in my sort of 40s and uh, d desperately wanted somewhere, I wanted some oxygen, I, I wanted greens. Um, and my wife had seen an article about a, a lovely ancient house that was owned by the authoress Penelope Lively. And she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if one day we know that house? I can see you're, you're, you're responding as if you've read one of her books. I love her, yeah. <laughs> well, well so, so, so we had something tangible um, in prospect here, her house that we, we actually briefly went to have a look at. And it became embedded. And about five years later, when we decided in earnest to go and find somewhere, we employed a couple of property finders um, who came to our house and sat down and said, could you please describe the type of house you're looking for? You know, and we sort of, we sort of tried to grasp adjectives out of the air. And, and in the end, my wife said, look, can I just show you a photograph of the perfect house, the, 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 the ideal little miniature manor house in a field? And uh, she presented it to them. They looked at each other and said, you won't believe this, Mrs. Mould, but it's coming up on the market in about three weeks time. And we uh, ended up um, in, in, in quite a protracted um, a sort of a, a bidding war, um, but we ended up with it. And so unlike William, um, uh, who was uh, partly to the manor born, um, we very much, um, uh, felt that this was a, a sort of need in our life, a bit like sort of trying to buy a dog or something like that. Um, and incidentally, a whippet has joined me since. So um, I, 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 I choose the comparison carefully. It, it, is, it has been the most marvellous amplification uh, to the joy of life. And I suppose as well, unlike um, William, you had to accommodate an awful lot of art, whereas I think we'll probably hear a little bit about William's journey to find some of the uh, art and antiques uh, to, you know, um, return to Upton Crescent. But do you want to show us uh, a few images, Philip, so we know uh, what the, okay, the manor you... house in the field is, or yes. would you like to... Okay. So, yeah. so just okay. So this is it. This is it. About three weeks ago, um, uh, in in the winter cold, um, and one thing, of course, that you know, 
all of you lounge lizards in London, cosily sitting in front of the radiators. You've got to know, unless you are um, a, an old house owner, that cold, <laughs> that drafts are one of the biggest parts of your life. In fact, you need to befriend them. Um, and that was a particularly cold moment. But you will see that this is a miniature manor house. Now, by manor house, I mean it goes back to the Doomsday Book. I'll come, I'll come back to that uh, later on, because we certainly didn't know that then, as opposed to a farmhouse. So what do I mean by that? It's quite sort of pretentious in a way, with that central gable. It's got four floors. It's a sort of look at me house, even though it's rather diminutive. And yet it's only got four bedrooms. Um, so it's a small, um, uh, extrovert and rather perfectly formed. And one of the things that drew me to it was, although the windows have slightly slipped and changed and the, the front door has moved and I suspect the dormers were put in in the 18th century, what you're looking at here is an extraordinarily rare survival. And that is an early 17th century yeoman manor house built, in fact, we know because we found the date hidden behind the fridge, um, carved by one of the builders in 1627. And for all sorts of reasons that, that um, uh, it, to do with history, to do with poverty, to do with chance, it's just managed to hang on in there and remain largely looking um, as it is now. And if you just go to the uh, photograph of its surroundings, um, you see that it actually still has its curtilage. And if you look to the left-hand side of the photograph, you can see a dovecote. Um, and if you look just to the right of the house itself, you'll see that there's a barn, a couple of barns. And we have about 15 acres uh, around, which um, I adore. They're my playground for meadows. And uh, we uh, recently introduced um, in fact, just go back to that last one, if you would, with the meadow. Um, we recently introduced, if you look at the right-hand corner, do you see that, that lump of stone? It's actually geologically shaped. It was found in an old field. Um, yeah. It's not, a, a, not an artifact, we'd be pleased to know, but it's a, it's a, um, a, a five-ton piece of granite that we just added to the grounds. We felt it was the only type of work of art that could work there. Anyway, so that's my dream. Um, that's my, our house and um, I'll happily tell you more about it later, but it's nothing compared to the grandeur of Williams. Let's move on to the historic grandeur of Williams House. Um, Gillian, do you want to share Williams slides? Brilliant. Here we go. And I think I, we, have, we have a confession to make. When we started marketing it, we were only using the coach house. It was a small sliver of the home itself. Well, um, yeah. we did have, there's, someone told me an amusing story about that the other day, which was um, that my father has always been um, a little nervous about when the sort of, you know, news cameras come up on a, you know, if there's some sort of um, uh, breaking news story relating to Brexit or something. Your father and, being the, 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 the major MP. Sir Bill Cash. <laughs> and um, I remember one instance when... Um, they, the sort of trucks from Sky News arrived or something. And um, my father said, said, gosh, you know, gosh, I, I really don't want to be, um, I really don't want to be photographed, you know, in front of the, um, in front of the house. So why don't we do it in front of the gatehouse? <laughs> and <laughs> they did the interview in front of the gatehouse. And um, anyway, yeah, it, um, it, people assumed that that was actually Upton Crescent Hall, but it actually wasn't, um, it was just a thing. But actually in, in all fairness, um, what Philip said, I think also about his house applies to Upton Crescent. You, you use the word grand, but actually we don't think of it like that at all because in fact, it's tucked away. It doesn't have a kind of stately drive and houses in the early middle ages and Elizabethan era, uh, especially this time, this is essentially, a manor house, which was, um, admittedly, the chimneys, you know, were stand out, but it was, it's a house that was very much um, uh, used, uh, okay, it was a center of the community, but it wasn't actually um, built in the sort of stately style uh, that became so prominent. And, and I think that's one of the things that we love about living here. It does look a bit grandiose, but I can assure you, if you come here, you'll agree that actually, um, you know, it, it has a certain homeliness about it. I, I just want to pick up on one or two points about what Philip said. 
I think the first thing that always people say when you sort of take on a, a house like this is, you, and you leave London and you don't kind of know quite what to expect, a bit like uh, my parents in 1970s, people will say you're totally mad to take on such a project. A good example of that is John um, Chalice, better known as um, Boise in Only Fools and Horses. And he's yeah. written a fantastic book about the restoration of Wigmore Abbey, which is near Ludlow. And, you know, it's so, it's so often the case with restorer rec romantics like myself and Philip, that actually, um, you know, one finds oneself following some sort of divine providence. I mean, that story that uh, Philip said, it just happens so often. In, in uh, Boyce's house at Wigmore Abbey, it turned out that his wife's coat of arms were carved above the staircase. Now, wow. the truth is that um, I'm afraid this kind of passion and romance often leads to complete disaster. And I will, I'm happy to talk about it a bit later, but there is uh, one of the things that ha we have in the house, which is quite extraordinary, is we have this uh, ornamental 17th century plaster work, which is replicated in four or five other houses around Shropshire, uh, including uh, Morville Hall, but most notably Buildwas Abbey, which is the abbot's house. And about two years ago, no, sorry, about three or four years ago, I found out that it was coming on the market, this abbot's house. And I lived and was very happily living at Upton Crescent with Laura and everything. And I found it came on the market and it, in some irrational sense, I just felt that the emotional journey of Upton Crescent wouldn't be complete until we'd actually expanded and acquired the abbot's house, uh, which actually is one of the most of flooded sites in England. It would have cost millions to restore, but something just grabbed me and fortunately I, I, I just about saved myself from from ruination by not not acquiring it uh, as a sort well, of as a sort of event house to do weddings and things but yeah. it's just so extraordinary that the pull that these houses have in yeah. my book I very much equate it to having an affair it, it really is like a romantic relationship and, and I felt that with Buildwas Abbey it, and in my book, I describe it as, as the Buildwas affair. It was like, you know, an indiscretion. I, I felt it, but you know, as I say. So can um, I take can I take you from your indiscretion to the to the amazing? I think is that a bedroom at the bottom. Yeah, of that's this. now that's a, that's Tell a really that, great. That, that's a lovely room. That is in the gatehouse. Yeah, and it was known as the Prince Rupert Suite. So tell now, us about Prince Rupert's relationship to the house, then, because yeah, I think well, also Philip has helped you with that. That's right, absolutely. So, so the Prince <laughs> Rupert Suite is actually quite quite an interesting story. He stayed not actually, I have to confess, in that very bedroom, yeah. because the bedroom. The, what's interesting about the house is how the gatehouse is so disproportionately. Uh, tall it, 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 it's really a prospect tower and that room there was a banqueting house so the gatehouse is really a banqueting house and when Margaret Thatcher came to stay in 1994 um, there's a lot of in, in people who have historic houses often um, revel in in the people who have stayed in the house before and it's true to say sometimes it's not entirely, uh, there's ambiguity about whether, when or whether a historic figure stayed in the house. And we, we know that Prince Rupert is alleged to have stayed there because it's in the history books, but we don't know for certain. So when Margaret Thatcher stayed, we knew for certain that she'd stayed in, in the room downstairs. So we called it the Thatcher suite. <laughs> and then we decided we had to kick Prince Rupert upstairs into the Prince Rupert bedroom, which is our honeymoon suite. And um, actually um, my wife, we've been locked up here for several months and just only last weekend, it is actually a holiday let. We, we rented out for honeymoon couples. And only last weekend, we took our children and Laura who'd never stayed there for a, a romantic, for a weekend in the, in our, in the gatehouse. Oh, so we road, test, we road tested it in the Prince Rupert bedroom. Um, I love that, a staycation. In, a staycation. In the, and Philip, did you, I, I'm sort of, is that Prince Rupert in the background there? Did it, or not, in the, in the dining room? No. Yeah, uh, I, can just, I can move around. Yeah, we've got. There we are, we can see it. I think that, can you see that? I know, 
the both of you have quite a long-standing relationship and have you supported each other in in these that's, projects that's there, yeah. philip uh, did can, can you actually hear me yeah i can now i couldn't for a moment but i can now good can you actually see my face at all by the way yes yes, yes. Not that you need to yeah, no, no, we do need to, and we can see it. Okay, well, I can't see yours, but that doesn't matter. Oh. Um, so, you know, such are the excitements <laughs> of, of of zooming in lockdown. Yeah. Um, so yes, William and I, we, we we go back we go back a long way. Um, uh, William is a is a dear friend um, and a ubiquitous sight uh, at, at London drinks parties, um, <laughs> uh, which is how I sort of really cut my teeth on William. Um, and uh, so when he said he was looking for works of art for his yes. house, um, well, being a second-hand picture dealer, I naturally said, well, perhaps I can help. Um, and the wonderful thing about Upton Cresset is that it is a, a sort of encyclopedia of history. Almost anyone who was anyone from, from the sort of 1500s onwards uh, seems to have uh, stayed there or brushed up against it including the glamorous royalist cavalry commander, uh, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Um, and so I was able to find Prince Rupert and uh, um, uh, sell it to uh, William for a very friendly price. Um, and um, he's um, put it up on his walls. And I, I, I remember coming for the sort of the baptism party, the sort of Prince Rupert's coming out at <laughs> Um, and it was great, and 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 it, it sort of reminds me actually of this of this very important thing about living in an old house, uh, which is trying to add things that suit the character of the house. Now, in the case of Upton Cresset, of course, you've got such great historical personages that um, uh, that you know you can choose from a galaxy of stars. You know, the princes in the tower and Charles the First and what have you. With our house, um, uh, we, well, when we arrived, we didn't know who lived there before 1950. And, and with the help of a local historian, we gradually got back further and further. And it was really thrilling. Every weekend we'd come up, because yes, we were, and sort of still are, except for lockdown weekenders. Um, uh, what would happen is we would inch deeper into history. And now we know who lived there every day back to about 1563. And the way that the uh, local historian who helped us do this, the way that she discovered that was using field names and the transactions that were associated with them. Um, and uh, she started in the 1950s with Carter Moss because the house was um, uh, about to pull down uh, and Carter lived uh, with his cows, I gather, and, and some um, horses in the, in the lower part of the house. But it was much more interesting, uh, well, not much more interesting, because I think Carter Moss was the compelling figure, always finding his horseshoes. But there were sort of all sorts of people who were associated with the Civil War and, and Banbury and the, and the greater story of history, the further back we went. And the high point for me was, I don't know whether you could find a photograph of this, um, but uh, we were in a, a cell at Sotheby's and there on the wall, this sort of face seemed to be beckoning me. And um, I, as I got closer, um, well, I could see that it was the rather sort of rich mellifluous strokes of an artist called Robert Walker, who was the Republican painter. He was the sort of the Van Dyke answer to, to, to showing roundheads. Um, although ironically, in this case, this was a royalist because it was none other than, than a portrait of Sir William Cope, who lived in the house, who actually partly built it. And so, goodness knows how it, how, how it ended up there. Um, but we were able to buy the painting, a bit like William with Upton Cresset and Prince Rupert. Um, uh, this was not a, a major figure. He was a he was a colonel uh, in the Civil War uh, on the royalist side painted by this Republican painter, rather oddly. Um, but now it's it's our little portal to history. We we have it on the wall. And for those who are interested, um, we can we can travel through its circular dimensions uh, 300 years back to the history of the house. And uh, mm -hmm. pictures like this are, 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 are like sort of audio visuals uh, for a house. And um, it's, it's been one of the many paintings that I've been able to talk about uh, in lockdown with my um, online series, uh, Art in Isolation. 
And um, one of the questions that has already popped up is whether Duck End is listed. And I know that both of you, and I think with William, with Upton Crescent, it's sort of changed in listing. So it'd be quite interesting to have a conversation around the sort of how the listing is done in, in um, Britain and um, whether that's a sort of um, a good or a bad thing, if you like, where, whether that's challenging uh, going with the graded listings or not. So just, start, I know you've got quite a lot to say on that, William. So starting with Philip, is, is Duck, was it listed uh, and to yeah, what yes, level? It, it is, and it, yeah. it's, grade, it's grade two, but in yeah. fact, it should be um, it should be it should be higher because of its um, uh, the, the integrity of its remains um, and the I gather the the, the, the local sort of um, officials uh, see it as such. But fortunately, we've, we've we've actually managed to avoid it getting to that two star point. So it does allow a certain amount of flexibility that perhaps we wouldn't be allowed normally. Um, although they do right. take a, a great interest in it. But it's this, this listing thing, which goes back to the 50s and 60s, of, of course, is, has, has been the saviour of, of the fabric of, of uh, uh, our, 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 our nation's architectural history. But um, as, as I think William will, 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 will tell us, um, it has some serious challenges. Yes, T tell us about your... William, because well, I know you've yeah. recategorized it as well, I think. Or had it yes, well, I mean, you know, people often say that, um, you know, it's you're sort of one of the problems with living in a historic house is that you're always up against planners uh, and that, in fact, you can never change anything. And in fact, my own experience is somewhat different. Um, I had a situation where about 10 years ago, uh, Upton Crescent, which is this kind of, uh, you know, jewel set in the landscape of P.G. Woodhouse's um, Paradise of England, as he describes it in the Blandings novels. And of course, P.G. Woodhouse was brought up in Bridge North and used to cycle around the lanes just round where we are. Um, unfortunately, some rather uh, greedy um, local farmers wanted to turn uh, the horizon around Upton Crescent into what's known as an industrial landscape. Let's just leave it like that. But the point being is that um, we decided we had to defend Upton Crescent. Um, and uh, one of the pieces of advice I was given, I described the story about how we sort of saved Upton Crescent from desecration, um, was to someone said, well, you, you really should apply to get Upton Crescent upgraded to grade one. And so we set about a kind of campaign um, with English Heritage. And in fact, they were, um, they were very open. And what actually had happened in the 1950s, as Philip just alluded to, the, the listing system was put together in a very sort of ramshackle way. Um, it came out of the war when uh, buildings in London were bombed and they had to decide quickly which ones were worth saving. And it then um, became a, a nationwide um, survey. But in regards to Upton Crescent, I'm sure someone just arrived on a bicycle like John Betjeman and, and John Piper did in 1938 and took one look at it and saw the pigs and decided that, you know, it was a ruin. Um, and I was absolutely, I will never forget to this day when uh, I went to the planning meeting to, this, to, to, to uh, decide the sort of fate of, of Upton Crescent. And the developer who wanted to put these industrial um, monstrosities next to the house had actually used the 1950s um, listing in which it said that Upton Crescent was an uninhabited ruin. Um, and it had not been updated since 1953. And the same applied to the church. So we now have three grade one listed buildings and three scheduled ancient monuments. And we absolutely adore sharing it all with the public. And, you know, we really enjoy the fact that mm -hmm. actually we can share the heritage, share the story. And I'm exactly with Philip in believing that the, uh, the, the buildings of England tell the story of England. And one really is stepping into history at Upton Crescent, as uh, Philip alluded to. And I mean, just a very sort of potted history, but we're very lucky to have Adam Dant, who some of you may know because he won the Cherwood Cher Cher Prize and is a wonderful artist who did the uh, murals here. But he has done a wonderful painting here called Time, Upton Crescent, Times Present and Times Past, which deals with all the historical figures uh, who've stayed here. And um, I suppose the beginning, um, it, it, yes, this is some of his work here, absolutely working. 
Um, and it, I think my favorite story really, and I, I, if you can see behind me, you'll see I've got a fire going. Um, in April uh, 1483, on St. George's Day, um, the, um, the young king, Edward V, um, uh, set off for the Tower of London, uh, where obviously he met a, a, a grisly fate, uh, being the, the princes in the tower. And we are almost certain that they crossed, the Royal Party crossed uh, the River Severn at Bridgenorth on, on the way to uh, London and stayed at Upton Cresset. So this very fireplace, which you can see behind us, behind me, is probably where young King Edward V warmed his hands on a freezing, probably April. And this sense of history is something that I think, um, you know, is one of the great uh, perks and, 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 and lovely things about living in historic houses. I mean, obviously people talk about ghosts and stuff. I don't know whether Philip's got any, any ghost stories related to, to his house. But in a way, um, you know, it's, I mean, Adam Dan always says that, you know, even um, when he goes around sort of painting places where the globe used to be, which is now like, you know, NCP car yeah. park or something. But the point being is that historical figures and buildings kind of live on yeah. even when they've been destroyed. And I think that that's what makes, makes living in a historic house so wonderful. You get this communion with history. So when, when um, yeah, I, Adam Dant lo love his work and he actually also very kindly did uh, one on Barclay Square in the Pas de Fer. And I think uh, one of my colleagues is in the picture as well as some more renowned uh, historical figures. So fantastic. But um, just going back to the practicalities and I think I'll start with you, Philip. You know, once you've, um, I mean, both of you have these wonderful projects. They've both been, uh, you know, uh, homed animals at some point. Um, and also, I think the dreaded formica probably crept in at other points. So um, how do you assemble your kind of crack team to strip it back to the bare bones and, and build it again? And, and starting with you, Philip, who, who are, what's your sort of key team that you need to get around you to begin one of these restore rec projects? Well, we were very lucky because the house, um, as I think I, I, I mentioned, nearly fell down in the 50s. Um, it was about to be pulled down, in fact. Um, but a, a loving couple ahead of their time uh, decided to start restoring it. And so um, we came to a house 20 years ago that was largely intact, didn't need any structural changes um, of, of, of any great um, significance. What it did, though, need was the reversal of all of this 60s, 70s and 80s sort of plastic and formica and wiring. And there were a few blocked in windows. And uh, I think probably the closest analogy, which, which will probably mean something to, to some of the viewers today, would be a, an overpainted picture, a, a picture that doesn't need structural restoration or intervention, but has just been covered with reversible overpaint. And uh, it was the most sort of thrilling uh, process um, using local builders in this instance, um, just simply to, 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 to drag everything out of the house, to, 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 to pull down the, um, the things that we now consider to be eyesores. Although probably actually now they might be retro and rather curious and lovely. <laughs> Um, but you know, you know how it is. Um, and so uh, that was, I didn't need, I didn't need lots of clever people um, around, although I did subsequently use Sims, the builders, um, who they're no longer around, but they, 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 they were a 150, 200 year old uh, building company um, who had a lot of experience with the Oxford colleges. Um, and they did some important stone work. Um, uh, but what's happened is over the last 20 years, we've gradually done things to the house um, or around, you know, we've restored a barn where we've done so much to the fields um, uh, in a process of uh, engendering wildflowers through meadow making, which um, it, it, many people will be familiar now with the wilding culture or the rewilding culture. But, um, I'm president of a thing called Plant Life, which is the wild plant conservation charity. And what I've tried to do is in the fields around is bring back some of that continuity and history that nature can offer. You know, wildflowers are the same as, as, as they were 2000 years ago in many instances. 
Um, and so getting back the history um, of, of the Kirklage, um, getting the diversity back, getting the wildlife back um, has involved uh, specialists and, and um, uh, assistants. Um, but it's just sort of one of the, the many sort of subtle things that we have been doing over 20 years. But unlike Upton Cresset, which, yeah. which to, to uh, Williams, poor parents, must have been such a, 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 a sort of chilling challenge to begin with, we had a house that was delivered. It just needed to have its, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the unnecessary um, eyesore accretia removed. And so, so to William, so I mean, I know having also read the book, we're talking phases, which is a, is a nice way of sort of talking about budgetary requirements for some of these phases, but what was the sort of the team you needed to assemble and, and do you find, because it's quite local and you were talking about the sort of houses used a particular pastor work, is it also, are you needing to use local artisans quite a lot for up to present yeah no absolutely um i mean i think that's one of the great uh, most one of the most satisfying aspects of doing the work is that of course um in the elizabethan era they would only have used sort of local um local chimney makers local plasterers local traveling plasterers i should say because they they did all these other houses and one of the great things has been actually shropshire has a great tradition of sort of artisans and my, my wife, Laura, is a milliner, as some people might know, Laura, Laura Cathcart Millery, and we have a, a working millinery studio in the grounds as well. So it's very much a kind of celebration of kind of artisanship. And I have a fantastic woodcarver called Andrew Pearson, who really is, uh, you know, the kind of Grinling Gibbons of, of, of Britain. And he lives in Ludlow and he uh, has done some carvings. And one of the tragic things about the house, uh, when my parents first came here in 1970, is when they first walked in, they found that the, a lot of the original panelling had been ripped out by vandals. And the house had a, a particularly wonderful dragon frieze, which we do have photographs of because it was photographed by the, I think it's called the, the, the National Commission of Heritage. Um, and I've actually employed Andrew Pearson to recreate this uh, dragon freeze in certain parts of the house. And that's been enormously satisfying. And in fact, above our bed, um, there is a, the, the initials of, of um, I believe it was Richard Cresset uh, were carved there with his wife. And I've, I've even gone so far as to get Andrew to, to recreate that uh, in, in terms of myself. So we, we've sort of exactly what, what um, Philip said, there's a real sense of, uh, continuing uh, the kind of artisan tradition. And I must just add one thing, uh, which is that um, in terms of uh, you know, when my parents first came here in 1970, it has to be said, and it's in the book, the anecdote, when I was talking to my father about the renovation, he said, you do know that um, we didn't dare tell our respective parents for two years that we'd actually taken on Upton Crescent in 1970. They kept it a secret because they thought that, you know, it was a form of madness. Um, but anyway, uh, the reality is, is that, you know, Upton Crescent has always been a, what I call a community hub. We now have a wonderful literary festival, which we hope to get going again. We have a writer's retreat here. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's exactly what Elizabethan medieval manor houses were. They were the center of the local community. Um, and I really hope that, you know, we are able to bring people back to the heritage and enjoy the woods, which we're renovating at the moment, uh, 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 exactly as, as Philip is doing with his wonderful meadows. Mm. And actually just thinking, because I can see where we're, time is marching on and we do have quite a lot of questions coming through, but um, just thinking about the future um, and particularly, I suppose, in, in COVID times and, and maybe beyond your own home. So um, to you, Philip, first, just the, the sort of perils of keeping these houses going. But do you think, is there a danger of some houses that have been open to the public actually not opening again, having gone through a year and a half of this? What What's... What are we looking at for the sort of future of historic houses? It, it, I mean, it's a grindingly perilous time, I think, for a lot of uh, houses open to the public. I mean, it's just it's, it's just the idea of being able to survive after being knocked sideways by, by almost a year of no income. Um, mm -hmm. And 
although I'm sure you know we'll we'll all embrace them again, um, and the public will 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 want to go in their torrents. You know, how do you how how do you overcome that this sort of fiscal malnutrition that they've that they're suffering from? Um, and I think uh, museums are in the same category, and of course, so are restaurants. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I, I think we, we need to be to be mindful uh, that the, the map may slightly change of, of, of some of the great houses of Britain. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me and, and just um, to follow on and, and maybe um, William as well, you can add to this. But although I am very worried about the future of, of many of these homes, one of the things that I think will be quite interesting is we're less um city and london focus so actually hopefully mm. some of the local ecosystem will help bolster up some of our historic houses um in terms of visiting gardens and spaces i hope but um i know you, william what what are your thoughts on well i, on I just want to say i mean I, I i think it's a fascinating subject i, I read the other day that the national trust are now sort of turning more of their properties into holiday lets. And I think there's something very interesting going on. I mean, when I was brought up in the 70s, I'm sure the same with Philip, you know, in the car was always um, Hudson's heritage uh, oh. guide to gardens and historic houses. And the reality is, is that um, people do love to come to, to these houses. <clears throat> but what's changed, and it's fascinating because I've got a sort of collection of uh, brochures of historic houses, which I've collected over 20 years is that in the old days, you used to open them up and it would be about the furniture and about the art. Not that there's anything wrong with that, Philip, but nowadays it's so much more about the family, about the landscape. And in fact, when people are coming to houses, and this is what we're doing at Upton Cresset now, it's not so much they wanted to study the furniture or look at the paintings. They want a day out. They, and that's why, you know, we, for example, are turning our wood into a, 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 a woodland heritage trail. And I think that this is the, 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 you know, where things are changing. People are desperate to get out of their houses. Uh, they want to be in a historic landscape. They want to be in a kind of a beautiful setting. And, um, you know, thanks to, um, you know, Norman Hudson, frankly, in the 1970s, uh, it, was, it, it made that period a kind of um, a golden age where people could actually acqu also acquire uh, these these re restore wrecks because they weren't particularly expensive and I don't actually think they're particularly expensive today because only a certain type of mad person takes them on in particular ecclesiastical properties I mean a great friend of mine has just bought the archbishop um, uh, a friend of mine has just bought the the archbishop's house in in Hereford um, for the price of a, a basement flat in Fulham but this is a great wonderful um, former um, archdeacon's house, I should say, with a sort of great Tudor Great Hall. And, and if anyone's interested in, in becoming a restorer wreck, um, victim or addict, I'd strongly suggest looking at ecclesiastical properties because it's a real niche. Um, and you can, you, as you say, you can get some, some wonderful um, bargains, frankly. And then you can go to, to, to Philip's gallery and populate them with, with, with uh, wonderful paintings. Um, we Thank you. We've definitely got some questions about that. Um, I just want, before we move on to questions, um, you gave us some wonderful images, both of you. Philip, were there any more that you wanted to share with us so that we could um, have a... Okay. There probably are, but but my my screen has... has oh, yes, of course. Has, has gone, has, you know, it looks like a sort of late Caravaggio now. I can barely see... Barely Anything. See right now, but I, I, I do, though, want to... Um, I do want to direct you towards a photograph I took about three or four weeks ago with the okay. sun com coming through the windows and this is an interior of Duck End. Um, yeah. um, and um, uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a large photograph of the sitting room, lots of pictures on the wall, you can see modern British and old, you can see the old farm, the, the old uh, fireplace. Yeah, you, we you, have it, it's up. It. Yeah. Okay, so, so I just wanted to, to say that um, when I first arrived at Duck End, I was a little bit sort of rigid, unimaginative and purist, and so was my wife. And we only wanted, you know, because we felt we'd got this sort of early artifact, 16th and 17th century things. But what has happened is, as the relationship has become more mature with the house, as, as we sort of trust each other more, of course, what really works, and one of the characteristics of, of these houses that's um, uh, so moving and lyrical is how the generations have added 
And what we have found is that putting in the odd modern British picture, you can see this painting, I think, on the right by Jan Buchanan, which is of 1930s, and, 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 and mixing them with uh, some Tudor pictures, uh, you get this sort of lyrical sense of, of continuity. Um, and it, it's more fun. Um, and mm. you don't have to be quite so sort of rigid. So I think one of the delights of, of having an ancient house um, is finding the right paint colors, getting the lighting right, and just slightly moving and living with it. Um, and that, that has been something that I think has taken 15 or 20 years for us to be bold enough to do because I was slightly square before. Probably still am. <laughs> Never. <laughs> and William, are there any um, pictures that you wanted us to have a well, look I at? Did... <clears throat> I should say that uh, we did have an enormous stroke of luck. Um, yeah. uh, these are some photographs from the book, but um, as I describe in the book, um, when um, just shortly after I sort of began the, the renovation, uh, my father had been in touch with the last descendants of the Cresset family. Um, and actually, um, Philip will know who I mean by Rufus Bird, um, who is a... An, an eminent figure in, in the, yeah. the world of antiques. And he is actually a direct descendant of the Cressets, no less. Um, and um, uh, his um, aunt, I think it is, is actually was a, a Thursby Pelham Cresset. And uh, the most wonderful family. And they decided about 10 years ago that they were going to put up at uh, uh, Christie's their, the remaining um, bits and bobs that were left from the Cresset estate, um, which used to be in, in a big house in, in um, uh, I think it was in Cadogan Gardens. And so we couldn't believe our luck. We got this sort of message from the last descendants of the Cressets. And the message was something along the lines of, we're putting the Cresset family furniture and collections up at Sotheby's. Would you like to come and have a look before we, we put consign it to sale? Well, you can imagine, it was just a sort of dream come true. And I said, you know, I said to my father, I think, you know, um, you know, it's a bit like kind of saying, you know, you know, we felt like it was Tutankhamun. Anyway, um, we did end up, um, we did end up um, acquiring some paintings. And in fact, in that original, if you go back to the dining room pa painting, the dining room shop, there we are, that's uh, Francis Cresset. Um, right. And I have to say, you know, I don't, Philip, I don't, I think he does do some tours at Upton, uh, sorry, at, at, uh, at, at Duck uh, End. Um, but we do a lot of tours and we also do holiday lets and the gatehouse and all that is all available, by the way, if anyone wants to, to come for a wonderful staycation as soon as the uh, opportunity do. arises. <laughs> but, but, but um, and that bedroom as well below uh, is very, very, very popular. But mm. going back to Francis Cresset with the wig, um, he was actually present. Uh, I believe he was, he was the treasurer to Charles I, was the head groom of his, um, um, of his bedchamber. And my father discovered the most extraordinary thing the other day, that the ring he, was, he is wearing, he believes was given to him personally by Charles II, because he was also at Charles II's um, uh, court uh, after the, before the restoration. So, you know, and, and what I love is, is standing in front of these paintings when I give the tours, and it's just so how wonderful, how great, you know, English portraiture is as a way of being a window into the times. And so, you know, we are actually, because of COVID, having to now to switch to audiovisual tours, but we still will do for, and I'm sure if um, uh, Lepardo want to do a, a, a kind of um, a group uh, visit like the Royal oh, Academy did, we're happy to do a tour. Um, but the, if it wasn't for the paintings and Prince and Rupert, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be nearly so, so interesting. Mm. <laughs> I doubt that. Very, very good raconteurs. Um, I'm just going to turn because I think we actually have quite a lot of um, questions coming in. That is not in the Q and A's, but was in the chat, which uh, tickled me. Was are your ghosts friendly uh, to to both of you? But then uh, I, I will. Um, do you, do you have ghosts in either venue? Um, well, well, when we arrived, we, th we thought we'd heard the ghost of an aeroplane because during the Second World War, this was the highest point around Enfield um, uh, sort of landing strip was, was, was quite yeah. close. 
and a couple of bombers crashed. And the first night we were there, um, uh, here at the house, I should say, um, we, we, we felt the whole house vibrating as if some bomber um, had um, uh, sadly sort of spluttered out and landed in the fields around. We've never heard it since, um, but <laughs> subsequently have found out a lot more about the, the activity of aircraft in, in the area during the Second World War. So um, call, call that a ghost if you want. <laughs> And um, so I think you've answered one of these questions already, actually, by showing us how you've sort of started incorporating contemporary art, because we had a question um, yeah, from someone who has a 17th century former worker's cottage um, that they furnished with antiques, but they want to incorporate some contemporary art. So perhaps we can give some tips on that. But one, I think, um, that is to you, Philip, but actually, I think both of you would be able to help in answering this um, is how do you light paintings in an old house when you've got small windows and limited natural daylight? Um, so how do you make it feel, let, see the picture uh, prop in its full glory, but also make it consistent with the, with the house? Um, it's, it's, a it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think I, particularly with a low slung um, uh, ancient house that's in a good state of preservation, it's a, it, it, is, it is a challenge. But there are answers. One of the answers is sunken lights in the ceiling. Uh, I know that that's a sort of um, ra ra rather a conventional and, and, and sometimes rather crude response. But my goodness me, you can get ones that are almost invisible these days. And for a good picture to be well lit, particularly in one of those dark rooms, you know, those rooms are dark, you know, it's not sweetness and light 20th century architecture. <laughs> You know, you're, you're living in you're living in a, in a sort of glorified cave, which is one of the reasons if, if you live in a Tudor house or, or early house, one of the reasons I showed you that photograph was because the sunlight was coming in on this sort of, that lovely yellow sort of Christmas light. And I wanted to show you what it was like. The, the other thing is light a few, don't try and light everything. You know, otherwise you look like a damn picture gallery. So, so have some low lights, have some, have some um, you know, possibly a few up lights, um, light a few well, but don't feel, even if you've got lots of great pictures, don't feel you have to light every one. You know, it's rather, uh, lighting is a bit like punctuation. You know, you don't want too many, too many semicolons. You've just got to al allow some of the, the things just to work, some of them to back off into the half light. Uh, and those who are interested uh, will come and have a look at them. And, you know, and, and, and don't forget, you know, if you've got every single picture on your wall, you know, bearing down upon you um, with, 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 with sort of e extrovert glistening brilliance, it's a very tiring look. Yeah. yeah. And William, have you, have you had to sort of think about how to display, having managed to get some of the treasures backed up in Crescent, have you had challenges displaying them? Oh, um, I mean, <clears throat> not really. I mean, frankly, you know, my situation is rather different from Philip, where Philip <laughs> probably has used the house in a way as a way of, um, uh, you know, if he's got paintings that need to be displayed, I should think, you know, th yeah. there's no short, he's got no shortage of supplies. <laughs> I've got a lot of art, you're right. Well, I have the... <laughs> I've got the other, the exact opposite problem <laughs> to Philip, which is I'm that sure he can um, help. essentially my budget uh, only. <laughs> so my budget, and, and I have to say that Philip was very generous. Uh, he'll remember that um, basically, you know, as I say in the book, the house was done in various phases, which basically meant a phase was like running out of money, basically. So. There was one period where I think it probably did combine with um, Prince Rupert. And, and uh, you, I have to say, Philip was very good. I think that the bill didn't come in for about a year, which was very, very generous. But anyway, the point being is that um, I specifically only have bought paintings that have direct historic relevance to the house. Yeah. Because, um, uh, so for example, you know, the, 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 the Francis Cresset, the Prince Rupert, and I've, I've always coveted the idea of an Edward V. I think they're called corridor portraits. Is that right, Philip? That's correct, yeah. I think you've got an Edward V that's duck end, don't you? Uh, we, <laughs> um, yeah, but I, anyway, I, I the point is, is that it's certainly nice. Mm. <laughs> you sold it, did you? 
Uh, well, I think I think. Anyway, I'm, but no. Um, um, I've got one. Uh, but anyway, got... no. So I, I, I didn't have. The... No, I'm just saying that, that. No, I mean, I, I totally agree with Philip about the lighting, but it, it's not a, a problem that I have. I have to say, I've had to sort of um, brood That's over too much because um, uh, just if we get a painting, it's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a few more minutes left, so I. So there's um, one more question here, which I think we'll, we sort of touched on, but. Um, it's from Melanie Lewis. And do you think you would do enough in this country to cultivate and nurture traditional craftsmanship? What does the future hold for our heritage houses that rely so heavily on specialist skills to preserve them? Uh, either of you can 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 start that. Whoever's. I, I, well, I, I think William has got probably more experience about that, haven't you, William? Well, I I know who I know Melanie. Uh, thank you, thank you for the question, Melanie. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of um, uh, in terms of the the uh, artisans. Um, sorry, what was that? Sorry, I'm really sorry. What was the question again? So the question is: is um, do we do enough in in the UK really to cultivate and nurture traditional craftsmanship? Tr uh, traditional craftsmanship. Yeah. Um, I think the answer to that question is that. Um, Traditional craftsmanship is something that, you know, the National Trust and English Heritage, actually, I have to say, have been, uh, and, and thanks to the Cultural Recovery Fund and all the other organisations, I don't think the industry would survive uh, were it not for the fact that these houses, you know, we are, we lead the world in actually having some of the great artisans. And these great tr professions, whether it's stone masonry or, um, blacksmiths or whatever the reality is is that um, I think England is the world leader um, and all I can say is you know as I said earlier we just th thoroughly enjoy employing the best artisans um, and thank goodness that we've got this um, you know incredible industry um, and I, th I think in all fairness the government have actually been very good I mean the cultural recovery fund um, you know, is of quite staggering size. And I really mm -hmm. hope it's being distributed in a way that will keep all these arts and, and, and trades going. Um, I'm sure, you know, Philip can talk about the, the, the art world, um, you, know, you know, restorers and conservationists and, and what have you. I mean, I don't know how they've been doing under lockdown, but uh, I imagine that, that, that they've been um, is supported by the government in some way, at least I hope so. Yes, I mean, I think a lot of art restorers have actually had quite a good time. Um, they, 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 they've rather enjoyed um, uh, sort of the, the fact that annoying art dealers aren't hovering over them saying, where is it? And they've been able to actually do some extremely good work in lockdown. Um, but that, of course, is a, is, is, is a different area. Um, it's not really, really house and, and yeah. home, which, is, of course, is what we've been talking about today. Um, just what just one final question that I've just seen in the chat, which I realise we didn't ask, um, Philip, is where why, why is your house called Duck End? Do you know? Is it? Oh yes. <laughs> well, thank you for asking. Um, so so Duck End. Uh, um, if you look up the word duck, um, uh, it, it has a, a number of uh, of applications, um, including the ducking stool, which was that, that hideous oh, yeah. testing whether someone was a witch, but a duck, duck end basically means the watery end of a village. And every village, particularly ones in the, in the country with, with a lot of farming around it, um, like, like here in the Cotswolds, required um, places to uh, wash the sheep. Um, and uh, we have the earthworks around us of uh, a sheep washing area, not quite the same as sheep dipping, but prior to taking your sheep to market, you would wash their fleece um, a few weeks before you took them to market because you would bruise them slightly in the process. So um, this is what happened here. And uh, I think uh, many farmers would have uh, uh, driven, if that's the past participle of drove, driven their, <laughs> driven their sheep down here anyway, um, uh, and, and, and had it done um, that way. And also the reason this is a manor house, and in fact, I should mention this, because we, we also established, um, we go back to 10, well, to 10, about 1090, when we were the, the manor of William, 
William being a knight. I mean, that was an astonishing revelation, you know, to, to bring a house back that early, or certainly the plot of the plot of land. Um, but one of the reasons that um, uh, the, this, this house was built here, like so many manor houses, and Upton Cresset will be the same because that, that you know, that's even though, even though we're a starter manor house, you know, they're a manor house too, um, is uh, water, the access um, and proximity to water. And then later on with pipe water, I gather a lot of houses were built away from in the 18th century onwards. But um, one of the things that, that um, uh, William and I have in common um, is um, uh, what we feel in our waters. I love that. <laughs> well, with that, I'm going to say thank you so much because we're sort of running out of time now. But uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, you will see uh, there is a lot of um, communication in the chat, but there are also links both to Art in Isolation, to up to Crescent Hall, to um, William Cash and to his book. Um, so you'll be able to find all of the resources and to learn more. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to ask more questions. This is a very sort of content rich um, conversation and both of you have so much more to say. And we haven't even really scratched the surface of the gardens either, given apart from talking about the wildflowers and meadows. So um, thank you so much, William. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, thank you. Thank you also to Cultural Communications who worked with us to put this together. Um, we will meet again on the 25th of March to talk about British designers, craftsmen and tastemakers. So something that we've sort of started the conversation with today. So um, many thanks to all of you um, and goodbye. Goodbye.